quite a nice start of a disruption talks episode that is a exceptional one so before i answer the question why i was just eating cake i will answer a question another one that you didn't ask but i'm asking it what's today's episode about today's episode is a episode that will let you know about fintech it will also serve the purpose of promoting what we will be soon releasing a disruption fintech guide and also leading up to our disruption forum fintech um but a personal introduction why this episode is particularly important to me um when I was 19, back in 2015, uh, we had a startup, Thomas Young, actually a past guest of Disruption Talks already. And uh, we were invited to pitch at level 39. I still treasure and cherish the Canary Wharf label tag that I got to enter for the one day. And I remember pitching to venture capitalists, high net worth individuals, scary stuff when I was called out on the stage. But the moment where I pushed myself to sink or swim, I actually swam. But I had no idea that it was Amy. I haven't met Amy. And Amy at the time was actually coordinating those events. So the importance of this event lies in the fact that Amy helped me without knowing me. And now, a couple of years later, she's joining me today to talk about everything fintech and level 39. And just to introduce Amy and answer why I was eating cake, it's level 39's eighth birthday today isn't it hi Amy. it is hi philip what a great introduction i love that story um but really pleased to be here and thank you so much for inviting me absolutely it's a pleasure i mean i love the story as well i remember i mean just the 39th floor was very impressionable uh, on myself so it's a memory that will stay with me forever but enough about me on to you let's start with a short personal story an introduction you joined Level 39 in 2014, right? I did, what? I did. So coming up to seven years with Level 39 now. Um, and, you know, I guess a bit about me and, I, and my role within Level 39. So my role's always been um, focused on our ecosystem. So developing that community of, of members, of startups, joining us here in Canary Wharf, but also curating that ex kind of wider ecosystem of mentors, investors, partners. Uh, you know, I've been really lucky to work with academia, governments, trade associations, you name it, who have come to Level 39 specifically to meet with, with our community. Um, but last April, I was appointed as head of Level 39, um, which was obviously an amazing opportunity after being with the company for a number of years. Um, obviously, got appointed immediately, COVID hit. Um, interesting time. <laughs> but, you know, we've definitely, um, you know, worked with what we have and our community have been incredible during this time as well. Um, so, you know, I'm just looking forward to to this year and you know when lockdowns ease and so on and things start reopening uh looking forward to starting seeing more people in person when lockdowns ease music to my in ear. london yeah exactly <laughs> wherever really wherever <laughs> give us a sign so can you tell us a little bit more about level 39 itself how it started what mission was it pursuing uh so i will return to this personal prism i also got some questions that in terms of you and level 39 but let's frame it for the audience absolutely um so the oranges origins of level 39 are that in march of 2013 uh the canary wolf group so the you know the real estate business uh the, the private estate owner of canary wolf um, really wanted to create an environment for small and fast growth companies in Canary Wharf um, that, of course, was different different to their traditional leasing model. You know, we have the big banks who, you know, have been in their buildings for many years. But, you know, the, the premise of Level 39 is creating this supportive environment that allows flexibility, um, both on a short and a long term basis uh, for these companies. For us, we specifically look at fintech uh, predominantly, but we do have companies in cybersecurity, um, companies operating in kind of the blockchain and short tech, reg tech spaces as well. Um, but really, you know, being in the heart of Canary Wharf, this is kind of the innovation cluster where we're seeking to bring together opportunities and synergies for Canary Wharf tenants that are already here with these fintech and cybersecurity businesses that are, are based with us. You know, our, our business model is very much based on physical space, but we do a lot more than that. We bring together mentors, investors, people in our wider network who give advice, they they support through services, um, 
you know, they challenge our businesses to really give them the best opportunity to succeed. Um, you know, some of our alumni are Revolut, who everyone knows, um, Digital Shadows, a big UK cybersecurity company, and, and Motive Partners as well. And, and those three companies are companies that actually started with Level 39 in the very early days. You know, I remember in 2015 when Revolut was like two people, and now they're hundreds in Canary Wharf. And the fact that those three businesses of ours that are now big scale-ups, unicorn business, you know, they are now kind of their headquarters. They are based in Canary Wharf with the Canary Wharf Group. We are really proud to have been part of that journey and facilitated that conversation with the Canary Wharf Group, our parent company, um, and, you know, really see them set their full base here and grow their teams here as well. So forget about COVID for a second. Let's pretend 2020 never happened. And let's speak about the past in terms of 2014 till 2019, 31st of December. How has that evolved since then until this artificial now that we have drawn without 2020, without COVID? Well, the most kind of physical difference is that we started with just one floor in one Canada Square. Uh, we now have 80,000 square foot uh, in one Canada Square in Canary Wharf. So, you know, physically our presence has grown and that's been down to the growth of our businesses. You know, so we started, um, I, I remember, you know, our, one of our, well, Digital Shadows was one of our first companies based with us. They had five people. They were part of the Accenture FinTech Innovation Lab that we hosted for many years. You know, a company like that starts as five people and really grows and grows and grows and their requirement increases. Therefore, we are able to expand our presence. Um, so that's the kind of physical growth aspect. But it also means that our community is really diversified. So we have companies that are joining us, you know, now that might be kind of one man bands, self-funded with a product. And then we have the other end of the spectrum, which is the scale up. So there's a real unique opportunity for them to also learn from one another, especially given it's curated. You know, these are companies that would have, you know, interesting similarities and potential, you know, partnership opportunities, given their focus within within fintech or cyber. Um and it's just, yeah, it's really interesting to see that dynamic now. We have 48 different nationalities represented here. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, Level 39 was, was approved as an endorsing body for the startup and innovator visa. So we're now also able to support entrepreneurs, you know, looking to establish a business in the UK through either the startup or innovator visa. And we're able to endorse that. So we can really be part of these journeys of entrepreneurs from all over the world who are, A, looking at opportunities here, but also we're able to connect our members in with, you know, our partners, um, organizations who are also supporting businesses to also scale internationally and into new markets. All over the world, international markets, diversity, 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 right? So building diversity, why is it important? How does it empower growth? I guess the, the key thing to think about initially is that, you know, we operate in the tech sector um, and the tech sector certainly does have a challenge of representation of talent from diverse backgrounds. Um, I think we all know that diverse teams outperform homogenous ones. You know, we think about innovation, creativity, agility. All of that is really only possible when a business has diverse talent as well as an inclusive culture. Um, you know, it's it's we we talk quite frequently and we've done a number of events and kind of brought in our partners on this topic as well because it's so important and we need to make sure it's it remains very uh, central to to our conversations but you know it's bringing in different thinkers and doers which does require diversity of thought ideas expertise experience both in life and in business um you know i talked about level 39 having 48 different nationalities represented here it means we have a melting pot of over a thousand different people of being, bringing together their experiences, their backgrounds, and therefore offering learnings with, with, you know, between one another. So, you know, what, what we try and do, given our focus in the tech sector and understanding that underrepresentation, we're really keen to profile our underrepresented founders. So, you know, just last week to celebrate International Women's Day, we hosted um, a panel with one of our partners, so a, an organization called London and Partners, who also very much support entrepreneurs both expanding into the UK uh, for the first time and, and scaling across the UK as well. Um, we hosted a panel to really spotlight different female founders and what their individual journeys are. And it was a really honest panel, a really honest discussion, um, you know, and they have all faced challenges, but it's, it's really about sharing how they've overcome them and a really interesting 
note that they all talked about is how they are naturally, you know, they are role models, even without necessarily asking to be, because they are, they are, you know, living this journey of a female founder um, in, in a sector that is, you know, where that is the minority. Um, so it's, you know, we're keen to make sure that we can spotlight those, you know, those people going through those journeys so that we can share it to our wider network and hopefully prom promote and encourage learnings so that we can create a more inclusive sector. Especially that it makes sense on the financial plane, as in you can treat every group that is the common denominator of race, country, whatever is the common denominator as a talent pool. And all of those talent pools have the top one, top 10%. So limiting yourself to not having access to all of those talent pools is just not financially prudent. Like you cannot afford to not be diverse anymore, can you? So um, how do you empower inclusion in teams? And what I'm asking is not in the sort of easy way out when you create such a great space like level 39 where it's inclusive by definition. But let's say we have a team that is introducing their first diverse member or is introducing half and half another set of people who will introduce diversity to a previously not so diverse group. Tools, strategies, anything? Where do you even begin to make sure that the people who were there feel good about this and ensure that everything works on their side, whilst also being very welcoming and assimilating to any diversity that wasn't there previously? That's a really good question. I can certainly share from what I've learned from, from people in our network that, again, that we have these conversations quite frequently. Um, I think something that's worth bearing in mind is, you know, the last year has really taught us that um, inclusive practices, especially in the remote working world, are so critical. Um, you need to ensure that everyone does feel involved, everyone does feel motivated, does feel inspired, um, because productivity comes from that. And productivity is critical to the growth of especially, you know, startups and scale ups that, that I work with every day. Um, I, again, I think one of the key things that has come up is how proactive you have to be with those inclusive practices. You know, it's not as simple as being in the office and making sure that you are having a, you know, you're able to have a coffee in that water cooler moment where you can kind of talk on a personal level and build trust. And I think the trust element is incredibly key um, in a remote working world, which we've obviously all experienced over the last year, that has to be even more ingrained, um, you know, just what you know what we do just generally is you know make sure that at 10 a.m every day we see everyone virtually you know we make sure that we have those catch-ups that people feel comfortable to raise challenges they might be facing for the day you know also share successes you know those are the small things that you realize you could very easily miss in a remote world um but i think moving to the kind of very much diversity and inclusion element it's it should be about accessibility to resources to training making sure that everyone feels equipped to to you know build and engage with inclusive processes within businesses um you know there's a lot of certainly in the uk I, i've seen so many interesting online resources for employers um and therefore their employees as well um and that is the likes of the the tech Ch talent charter sorry um, and that's a not-for-profit that effectively, you know, supports diversity and inclusion within tech roles. So it's how do you ensure that your re recruitment and retention processes within your business are inclusive um, and therefore also support a kind of a diverse workforce? Um, they actually, they have something really interesting. They've got about 500 signatories um, who, you know, kind of sign up to be part of this charter where there are certain commitments that they, as an employer, must must um, commit to. Um, but they've got this playbook of best practice. So it also means that they, with all of their signatories, they share the learnings of every other organization um, so that, you know, there is there is a lot of transparency of what are the challenges you know, and of course, every organization is different, but what are some of the challenges as how and how have some of them overcome them? Um, and, you know, I think what we, in terms of ensuring inclusive processes, there needs to be ownership as well. Someone needs to take charge of that, um, whether you nominate a steering group who, you know, very much look at the, the business as a whole, obviously as a smaller business, perhaps, um, you know, having one key representative or a group of representatives who people can also go to, there needs to be a, a speak up culture that people need to be able to also discuss personal experiences and challenges um, when it comes to, you know, diversity and inclusion within the workplace. So 
I think there's a lot that can be done, but there's a lot of resource for companies to be able to tap into both online and with organizations that they're working with. And I think it's, of course, like you said, there needs to be some top down commandeering of this. This cannot be just spontaneously done or expected to bring any results. But also on a personal level, I think we need to sort of mantra this into ourselves that uh, like, be proactively thoughtful, like to just be nice, just, yeah. just be just, just consider the empathize with the conditions, the circumstances of that person, step out of your shoes, step into theirs. And it's not that you're supposed to understand them, but the intent, the thought of doing that most likely will bring you positive results, but still proceed with caution. And I like what you said about the 10 a.m. calls with sharing successes or failures. We actually had uh, some, something similar of our own, uh, the acronym WTF, uh, <laughs> but it, it was, it's not what you think. It's win tactic failure. So that, that, that's how we went about our 10 a.m. calls in the similar, in the similar uh, fashion. So what are your favorite companies that do in practice everything that you just spoke about of in theory? So, you know, what I really am encouraged by is that there are so many companies willing and open to share their challenges, um, uh, hence why we're able to kind of gather data, you know, across charters, across organizations, there is now data which we can measure, so we can measure where there are successes and also where more, more work needs to be done. Um, if I may, I, I would like to share a bit about the FinTech for All charter that we, um, as Level 39, have worked a lot with um, over the last year. So that was launched by an organization called In Chorus um, during lockdown. So I remember speaking to Rosie and Raj, the founders, in pretty much March of last year. Um, and what they are, so they're, uh, you know, kind of a data organization. So they did about 10 weeks of research into specifically into the fintech sector. Uh, it was based on lived experiences. So they were requesting individuals to share um, you know, what their experiences have been in, in the sector. Um, it went down to everyday behaviors. That it also looked at microaggressions and it did go all the way to the other end of the spectrum in terms of harassment. Um, and this, again, fintech sector very specifically. But in terms of the responses, it very much focused on gender. So I think 85% of the experiences that, they, that were reported during that, um, that research were related to gender. And that is sexism, you know, stereotyping, being talked over, whatever it may be. So there's a lot of aspects to it that were um, specifically detailed. Um, you know, and also looked around the reasons of, of people not reporting those incidents. So it's, it's a quite a powerful, um, you know, mic microscope into the industry's biggest challenge with regard to kind of, you know, diversity and inclusion. Um, and, and following that research, they launched the FinTech for All Charter, which, you know, we're a... Um, we're on the steering committee of because, of course, I wanted to make sure that our our community of fintechs are fully aware of it. Um, and actually, from that charter, which of course is is around showcasing certain commitments that a signatory would would commit to, um, and you know, really with the aim to build a more inclusive fintech culture. There's now over fifty, no, over seventy, sorry, fintech companies that have signed. Um, and again, it's still in its infancy; it's only been going under a year. Um, and you know the the charter is really there to share best practice, similar to the tech talent charter that I talked about earlier. But this is very specifically fintech, um, and it's really looking at commitments that all fintechs who sign um, can really work towards. They're realistic, they're achievable. Um, it's for companies both small and large, um, and it's really to encourage them and support them in building those inclusive business practices. You know, they commit to certain things like having a senior exec accountable to, for diversity and inclusion, a bit about what we talked about earlier in terms of ownership. Um, you know, looking at a harassment and bullying policy and making sure that, you know, action you know is taken as per that policy. Um, and a variety of, of other elements based on kind of reporting channels and how people go about, um, you know, spotlighting when there are these incidents that take place. And I just thought that is such a, an incredible initiative to launch. Um, it's really, as I say, it's, it's really shown what the, the challenge has been for the industry. Um, and therefore, as a collective, we can come together and work to make FinTech more inclusive. 
Um, and as I say, you know, we very much amplify this out to our community. I'm really proud to see a number of companies join that as um, as signatories. Um, and we just need to be doing more together to, to highlight what the challenges are um, and then have real actionable um, processes in place to make it more inclusive. Okay, so uh, peanut gallery time. Uh, let's slap a label, let's slap a grade. NCAP rates cars, uh, universities rate us students. Uh, by the way, shout out Lancaster University. Um, <laughs> so you could either end up with a first class honors or you could end up with a lower second class honors or barely a pass. The fintech industry on the scale of diversity, what kind of grade would you give it? And perhaps speaking in one front might be very limiting. So let's speak in terms of Europe, in terms of the US, and then some mix of a global uh, global perspective of those regions that I mentioned and the others that I haven't. I think giving it a grade is going to be difficult. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm... I have to and give that a thought. Motor score, if you will. <laughs> well, look, I think there is evidently still a way to go. Um, I th you know, the the founders that we have at Level 39, as I say, come from, are effectively global and they have global businesses. So I, I don't think that this is something that just the UK are facing by any means. Um, and I think, as I say, as a sector, we need to address this. We need to address the challenges. And hopefully, you know, in another five, 10 years time, these conversations don't need to be as prevalent because, you know, there are a lot of issues that have already been resolved or there are you know, processes ingrained in these companies from whether it's from kind of the earliest start of their business journey through growth or whether they are started now and therefore kind of come to fruition over the next couple of years. Um, you know, if we look at, at just a couple of stats, and, and again, these are kind of UK stats. So, you know, I, I don't have these stats for, for the other regions you mentioned. But if we do look specifically at the UK, when it comes to gender diversity, 17% of fintechs have female founders. So that's really low. You know, we've got, um, if we think of, out, you know, more kind of ethnicity and diversity, black female entrepreneurs, when it comes to investment, um, in the last decade have had 0.02% of funding in the last decade. So they are at an even greater disadvantage. Um, so it's, you know, whether we look at the investment um, aspects of, of diversity or whether we look at how founders are represented, um, there is still work to be done. To be done. I mean, we've worked with a company called, uh, on the investment side, called Diversity VC. And if you haven't heard of them, they are a not-for-profit who um, basically work with investors, entrepreneurs, universities um, to create an investment industry free from bias. Um, so, you know, there are some, in uh, you know, I also talked about FinTech for All earlier. There certainly are um, organizations and initiatives that are, you know, with an aim to drive change. But, you know, I think we've still got, go, you know, as I mentioned, a couple of those stats, we still evidently have a way to go. Diversity VC, was it? I'll, I'll Google it yeah. later. Diversity yeah. VC. Yeah, we actually did an event with them in December, uh, which was about building back better, uh, but with a specific emphasis on um, diversity and inclusion. Um, so, um, Saranga, who is the a partner at Boulderton Capital, he he actually is is on the um, he's a chair, I believe, of of Diversity VC. So it's, it's yeah, great organization, really interesting, and I definitely recommend checking them out. Hope we're watching. Um, so on to the topic we've loved to grow and hate and love and <laughs> hate COVID. So uh, impact on the area of diversity in the sector that we spoke about because. I know that on one hand, on one side of the scale, we have the situation in which an uh, office that was based in Geneva, say, they uh, one and a half year ago, they would be hiring locally because people would come to the office. Whilst right now, it's fair game. The playing field has never been as level as it is right now. So that seems to be in favor of the inclusion. But at the same time, we know that, uh, and of course, here I'm speaking about children, so perhaps not ideally similar to what we're talking in terms of level 39, but I'm sure that that resonates in different places. We know that, for example, with remote education, where there is growing uh, illiteracy uh, because some kids 
just don't have their own computer, for example, or they're too young to be left alone and expected to sort of self-teach themselves from the screen of a computer. So my question is, to boil it down to a sentence, what's the good, what's the bad, and which one outweighs which? So, you know, speaking from a kind of a London-based perspective, um, you know, if we're talking about, you know, diversity and inclusion in this kind of remote world, um, you know, the, the, a real encouraging factor from the last year has been that um, with everyone working from home, it has, you know, as you mentioned, it's prompted companies to effectively start hiring remotely, interviewing remotely, going through that entire like onboarding process remotely, um, which does mean that they've started to consider candidates outside of their kind of traditional location or geographies, um, which actually means that they have a higher chance of getting candidates with different backgrounds. You know, they have different experiences. They perhaps are from, you know, different cultures. So they bring more kind of diversity to the fold uh, within that organization. Um, I think that's a really positive element of, of what we've seen over the last year. Don't get me wrong, you know, I think even with kind of global teams, I think people will still want in the future when we're able to, people to come together and have that kind of personal contact time in person, whether that is for, you know, once a month, once every couple of months. Um, and of course, you know, Level 39 seeks to facilitate that and offer the flexibility for them to do that as well. Um, but I think, as you say, you know, the last year has really shown a, a kind of a digital divide, you know, for uh, exactly as you say, for for children who may not have had, had access to equipment when there was suddenly a big move to, to homeschooling. And I think that's also put a huge pressure, especially on, on mothers. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk that, you know, as mothers um, being the primary caregivers and, and actually trying to work full time and homeschool, um, I'm sure has also had a massive impact on, on mental health. Um, so, you know, I, we have colleagues that have homeschooled and I'm imp so impressed to see that, you know, that they bring their full selves to work whilst also being able to homeschool their kids. Um, and I think, you know, in, in the UK, schools went back to, to work last week, uh, back to work, went back last Monday. Um, and I think already for children as well, um, being surrounded by their peers, and having that opportunity, even for like soft skills, you know, what you expect from school, you know, you'll be able to kind of bounce off your peers in school. I think that is going to be really beneficial moving forward, um, especially over the last few months where they haven't necessarily had that. Um, so, yeah, I think there have been some there's been some positives that we've seen from the last year. And certainly there have been some, you know, as we also know, with kind of unemployment and the furlough scheme and, you know, all of these things that a lot of people have had to deal with some pretty challenging um, aspects over the last year as well. When uh, when you spoke about uh, the, the, the motherhood aspect of all of this and having to stay at home due to the sort of societal expectations, uh, Professor Scott Galloway, also Prof G from the podcast with Kara Swisher, Pivot, he speaks a lot about that. I recommend to you or anybody from the audience listening to, to pick up on that. Of course, he speaks from a United States angle, but still it's, it's just as relevant to, to what you said. So... A follow-up question, because it's not difficult to imagine a scenario in which, I mean, most companies, and I'm not saying the ones that deal with you or we deal with or ourselves, like Level 39 and Guru, of course, we are not that bad. But there's a lot of companies that don't go for B Corp certificate. There are a lot of companies that don't go for the diversity or inclusion. They just care about the PL sheets, right? So how do you increase the profit? How do you decrease the loss? You go remote. And even though that might be under the cloak of diversity, sort of the primary decision to do so is more talent at a cheaper rate. Do you think, because it's not difficult for me to imagine such a bad situation in which, let's say I'm the decision maker, okay, get rid of the engineers here or minimize them to the essential team members, outsource it, let's take some teams remote. But then when you onboard them and do nothing to feel, to make them feel included, doesn't that create a even bigger anti-diversity? Isn't that like a, expanding the gap unknowingly? Yeah, I mean, I think what, touching on what you said about onboarding new employees, I mean, certainly from conversations I've had with um, our, you know, our members and, and just other kind of organizations and, and entrepreneurs I speak to, with quite frequently, 
I think there are some difficulties with, with doing that too. You know, you also have to consider the kind of administrative things of hiring anywhere in the world. You know, there are different um, contractual elements, employment law, you know, what salary do you pay them? I think there's a lot of kind of administrative things to consider. Um, but yeah, you know, I think human nature requires you to, you know, be surrounded by people, not necessarily every day. And I think flexi it's great to see that flexibility has come from the last year. And I think that will continue. Um, but I think there is an element of wanting to understand someone personally, which I think is limited in a virtual setting. Um, you know, so the days that I come into to level 39, even at the moment, we see people come in because they need to work here. This is the environment that they feel most productive. Um, and I think that productivity part is really key. In the last year, a lot of companies have seen, you know, their productivity has, you know, very much continued, if not increased, um, which obviously therefore begs the question, oh, do we ever need to go back to the office? But I think that is perhaps, that is perhaps not, not something that's sustainable, sustainable because we've also been we've also done it. We've also not really had, had any there haven't been happen the opportunities to, to have a social interaction with your colleagues or with friends or with your family. Um, so I think, you know, as things start opening up, what people will want and will be craving is that social interaction, that collaborative working together. So, I, you know, I envisage that, um, you know, if, if companies had have decided over the last year to completely cut costs and, and go remote, that may well work perfectly well for them. Uh, but I think it's important to really understand every individual within your company, what their needs are, you know, to make sure that they are also, you know, kind of not only productive from a business standpoint, but also, you know, happy that they feel included, they, they feel that they have built relationships, personal and professional with their colleagues, and that they have that trust to approach someone if there was a problem, because that's obviously what you want, you want your employees to feel really comfortable to say, I don't understand this, or this is really challenging. It's not going to get done unless I have support in X, Y, and Z area. So, you know, it's just about making sure that those communication lines are really clear. And if you, you know, build that into your onboarding process in a remote setting, you know, I'm sure that that would, that would also work. I just, you know, certainly from a personal perspective, I'm a people person. So I would definitely want to be building those relationships face-to-face um, -face as soon as we can. So now on to my own my own questions. Uh, these are the questions that I always ask uh, to our guests. And mm -hmm. question number one is your decision-making framework. It doesn't have to be specific. It can be general. That's completely up to you. It's just more of a what kind of decisions you face uh, and what is like the rule of thumb that you decide to evaluate whether, for example, this is a good decision to follow. You can frame it into some practical example, or you can just stay in theory. Um, that's a really good question. I mean, the key thing for me is I always think I always go back to as a business. You know, a what do we seek to achieve, um, and if the um, if the task at hand um, it's allows us to achieve that, then fantastic. But we also need to make sure that that is achievable um, within certain timeframes and ensure that the team are equipped and feel comfortable to deal with that. Um, you know, it goes back to a little bit earlier, I talked about accessibility to resources and training. Um, something that we are really always keen to do at Level 39 and across Canary Wharf Group is, is upskilling and ensuring that our team always have access to, um, you know, training materials, um, online materials. We actually have um, an alumni at Level 39 called the Center for Finance, Technology and Entrepreneurship. And they, they, they are like an education platform for, you know, for fintech. Um, and actually, they're one that I always recommend to our team to, to have a look at, you know, if they're ever, try, you know, looking at emerging technologies or interested to, to understand a bit more and go through a kind of a, a course on that to get a deep dive understanding, I recommend doing that. Um, so I guess, yeah, it, the, the key decision making framework being, is it, um, does this meet the objective of the business? And can our team, you know, sustainably deliver it and continue to do so for the future? And finally, does it spark joy? I'm sure, I'm sure that is also the question in the decision making framework. So question number two, before we proceed to the questions from our comments, what should we teach every 12 year old? I hand you, uh, metaphorical magic wand, abracadabra, each 12 year old has just been given access to, 
we've heard emotional intelligence, coding, structural thinking. You can repeat any of those. You can have uh, your new one that we haven't heard yet. So what do you think would bring a lot of good? Um, I mean, something and, you know, touching on the fact that we've we've talked about diversity and inclusion, it would be, you know, making sure that all 12 year olds know that there are there are no predetermined roles for them based on gender, ethnicity, background, whatever it may be, you know, they can go after whatever they have a passion for. Um, they're always going to be champions. So, you know, find those people, find your role models. Um, and I think, you know, aspire to whatever you wish to be I think it's a, it's a difficult one but I certainly yeah I think there are a lot of things that we could yeah teach 12 year olds and just make sure that they feel inspired to be you know whatever they want to be um in the future true true I mean if I were to ask myself that question like what would I teach 12 year old Philip definitely coding like I'd probably super be super rich right now if I knew how to code <laughs> at the age of 12 <laughs> See, I'm not. That's the thing. I also was trying to think when I was twelve. Like, what was I even thinking about? And yeah, I, I, at the time, then coding, yeah, was not even. I don't think I'd even thought about that or knew about that. Um, but certainly, yeah, putting that in front of a twelve-year-old now probably know about it already. There are so many incredible initiatives in schools, like Code Club here in London. I mean, you know, it's it's quite incredible now to think twelve-year-olds versus my twelve-year-old self. <laughs> True, true, true. So on to the questions from our audience. And boy, do we have a couple. Uh, one is from Kasha. Let's begin with that. Along with Level 39's growth, you grew as well. Started out as an events and marketing manager, and now you're heading the entire operation. Can you share your experience of that transition? Yes, sure. Um, so do you know what? My experience and journey at Level 39, and obviously with the Canary Wharf Group being our parent company, has been incredible. So. When I joined um, back in 2014, it was my first job in London. Um, so I had, you know, albeit I hadn't moved far, I only lived an hour away anyway, but moved to to London for, for Level 39. Um, and yeah, I started with that kind of events and marketing role because that was their requirement at the time. Um, but I realized that I joined such a small team. I think we were about six people then, maybe even smaller actually. Um, and I ended up doing events and ecosystem activity so um you know and i realized pretty quickly that actually ecosystem stuff was not only taking up most of my time but also was where my passion really lay so you know i wanted to work very closely with the founders that we have here i wanted to kind of understand what their challenges were and and find innovative ways that we could support them um and really i mean the reason the the kind of journey at level 39 has been you know so supportive and i've obviously grown so much as a person both professionally and personally, um, is because I've always had fantastic managers. Um, so my first manager was um, a lady called Adiza and she was so passionate and, you know, really pushed me out of my comfort zone. Like there were things, yeah, you know, I had to do presentations and things that I was actually quite nervous doing. Um, and she always, always pushed me. Um, she then kind of moved on to, to other things. And again, I kind of progressed in that role. And then Ben Braben, my latest manager he's he was fantastic as well and it was just that supportive culture within an organization you obviously i I'd, I'd been with the company for years anyway and you naturally know a lot of things almost like the back of your hand but without the supportive leadership and of course i worked so closely with um our leadership in canary wharf group as well i really wouldn't be where i am you know they believed in me as well you know by you know offering me the the role you know, last April, it was kind of believing in me that I, I could, I could lead the team. Um, so, so yeah, it's been, it's been an incredible journey. Uh, it's been really fun. It's, you know, I, I think I say this quite frequently, but no day is the same at level 39, because you just no, have no idea who you're going to meet. Um, and everyone you do meet is so inspiring and so ambitious. And I just love every conversation I have. Um, a short break for a question from me, chocolate or strawberry? In terms of the food? Yeah, in terms of cake. Oh, always chocolate. But oh. I gave up chocolate for Lent, which I've, I've been regretting every day since. So I've only got a couple of weeks left, but always chocolate. Okay. All right. So on to the next one. Uh, this is Tomas. Two years ago, he spoke to Ben Braben, or Braben, I hope. I am pronouncing that correct, former head of Level 39, and he concluded that even with Brexit, if you want to improve the way in which global finance works, 
Level 39 and London was the best place in the world to start. Does that still ring true in 2021? In short, I believe so. Um, you know, I speak to entrepreneurs frequently who are still, you know, looking at um, London as a place to do business. Um, and, you know, even with Brexit, and now obviously we, we've already gone through that transition and still continue to, but, you know, every entrepreneur I speak to is still really excited to set up their business here, you know, specifically in Canary Wharf being a financial center, you know, it's that proximity to potential institutions who could be their partners, could be their customers, um, and could build really valuable relationships with, um, you know, they certainly see that still as a market that they, and a mature market, especially for the fintech sector, that they want to tap into. Thomas, let us know if that answers your question. Um, one from Pavel. Uh, we saw digital payments and e-commerce being major winners of the COVID lockdowns. Understandably, saw what happened with Amazon. What about post-COVID, who will benefit most in finance on the rebound? B2B, consumer fintech, services for micro companies, or maybe it won't be about fintech at all. That is a good question. Um, you know, I, from my experience, I we have, as I said, you know, we have companies spanning kind of different tech sectors. Um, and I've seen so many incredible successes um, in, you know, in the last, even in the last three, six months. Um, so I think, I think it's going to be a bit of a variety. You know, one of our uh, cybersecurity companies um, called CybeSafe, so they very much look at the, uh, like the human aspect of cybersecurity and kind of like educational training and, and behaviors. They just raised their Series A um, and they are scaling and they are, you know, catching up with them is really quite encouraging because yes of course at the moment then they're, they're not in the office but looking at their future plans is is really exciting um and you know i think for them as well in a post covid world things will you know hopefully bring more certainty um but will certainly bring uh, some exciting prospects so you know i think certainly from from a level 39 perspective i think it will be a bit of a mix hello that satisfies my uh, my need for the answer, hopefully yours as well. Tomas, again, with a really cool question. Can you give a shout out to female founders working in fintech? Who would you name? Who would you say hi to in given this occasion? Oh, there are so many. Well, the ones I spoke to most recently. So um, Amber Gadar, who is the founder of Alliance Block. Um, so a kind of a blockchain business in the capital market space. Um, she actually spoke on our um, London and Partners FinTech panel last week. Um, and the reason I will give a shout out to her is because she's also now launched a, an initiative to support and increase funding to female founders as well. So not only has she got her day job as Alliance Block founder, uh, she's also now working on this fund as well, um, which is, is really exciting and hopefully will bring a lot of value to other female founders uh, in the industry. And the next one is on a thing that I'm guilty myself of traveling to Switzerland. What's your take on business meetings and travel? Uh, I guess removing physicality takes a special toll on level 39, given that it was to begin with a physical location that gathered people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we had to certainly um, rethink a few things um, when we first went into lockdown last year, but something we've really really seen um and this is through you know response from our our not only our members but our wider network as well um but the community and ecosystem that we've developed really is the value and a lot of people want to connect with one another in person so albeit whilst right now you know there's of course social distancing we have all the covid secure and covid safe rules across level 39 in canary wharf um you know we're very much looking forward to being able to host events, roundtables, lunches, just all of the social things, our members meet up, so I know all of our members are missing. Um, we're certainly looking forward to doing, doing those in person. But in the meantime, obviously, what we've done is moved everything virtually. So uh, we've launched our own podcast series. We run community stories to spotlight our founders. So very much um, a, you know, a, a platform by which, even though you aren't in level 39, you can still you know, hear people talking about challenges that entrepreneurs are facing, um, hear from thought leaders, connect with industry experts through our virtual mentoring and virtual investor sessions. Um, and we've done a number of virtual events using platforms like Remo, which albeit nothing replaces that real face-to-face -face interaction, but Remo has been a fantastic platform for us 
um, when we do our events because it allows us not only to, of course, host panel discussions and presentations, but it allows you to, following those presentations, break off into groups. Uh, and effectively, you have small table conversations that are, you know, just small Zoom conversations with three or four other people. So, you know, it's... Um, it's quite interesting to see how things have developed and, and the take up of those technologies. But as soon as we're able to, I'm very much looking forward to starting seeing people in person again. Right there with you and <laughs> uh, people in person. Uh, it seems like we have uh, exhausted all the audience questions. So hope our audience is happy with uh, the answers that we have provided. And uh, I see that we are hitting the 45th minute mark. So it's right about the time where we could wrap this up. So the key takeaways from today would be be proactively thoughtful and nice. And if you do that, maybe you won't get their 100%, but you're already ahead of the pack. That's for sure. And in terms of uh, the Disruption FinTech Guide, you can find in the comments a link to a report that gives you the state of play of fintech. It's been done with partners like Level 39 or City Ventures. And I really recommend having that lecture before you attend our disruption forum on fintech, which is also coming very soon. So all the links to sign up, to subscribe, to follow, to get what I just advertised to you, they're in the comments waiting for you. So Amy, thank you so much for being such a graceful guest. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for having me, Philip. Absolutely. And oh, the final takeaway is once again, happy eighth birthday. Oh, thank you. We will be celebrating as a team today. Are you staying in the office, by the way? Or was this just for? I I come in every couple of days, obviously, just to make sure that things are still still okay. We as I said, we have a number of members that do come in because they have, you know, they really do feel they have to work here. So um, you know, it's good to be able to kind of catch up with them from a social distance as well. Uh, but yeah, my, a couple of my colleagues are in, so we'll certainly have some social distance cake to celebrate. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, thank you for today and uh, good luck with your Lent. I hope thank nothing. You. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait for Easter. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much and uh, see you soon. Thanks, Thanks everyone. You,